Welcome everyone, Costin here with a discussion about the worst races in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. And the races that I'm going to list in this video are races that I do consider need either major overhauls or significant buffs or campaign improvements across the board in order to make their experience more enjoyable. Now I want to be very clear, you can beat the game as any race if you so desire, you can play the Demon Prince or Kugaf if you want to, and you can certainly beat the campaign. That doesn't mean that the design, balance, and just overall campaign dynamics that these races have to deal with is great. At number 7 we start with Kislev. Now Kislev does have some powerful legendary lords. Boris Ursus and Madra Stankia can actually gain a significant amount of power in their campaign. Though in Boris Ursus's campaign it is going to be a bit slow going because you're going to waste a lot of time traversing territory early on in the campaign. But once you get going, you get going. The problem for Kislev is that even though Kislev does have the army, especially with the DLC, to be good in a campaign, Akshina Ambushers are really good as a tier 2 unit. Uh, you have Hag Witches, Frost Maidens, you have Patriarchs for a significant amount of replenishment. You have solid cavalry in terms of Warbear Riders, good infantry, and so on and so forth. There are a couple of issues that really do plague Kislev in, uh, as a race. The supporter system is awful. Like, they took the system from a Total War Saga Troy that Paris and Hector had to deal with, and they implemented it here. And with the exception of Madre Sankia, all of the Kislev legendary lords have to deal with this one way or another. For Catra and Castalton, this is a rope around their neck. It severely limits their campaign because in order to confederate the other, you need to get to 600 supporters. Even worse, if you're playing Catra and Castalton, in order to get your short campaign victory condition, which gives you hero capacity, which is pretty significant, you do need to get a fairly high level of supporters, those 600 supporters. That is one of the most ridiculous short campaign victory conditions in the entire game. Then you have the issue of invocations. Invocation require devotion. Devotion is gained by fighting chaos, but the, the cost increases the more territory you gain. So. As you gain more and more territory, you kind of get screwed. But you do need to maintain invocations, particularly Urson, and gain territory every single turn in order to get those supporters that you're going to need. Now, those are issues for Catherine, Castalton, and yes, even Boris Ursus to a lesser extent. He still cares about supporters because he can get the temporary buff like 20 Grove, leadership speed if he supports Catherine. If you support Castalton, you get control temporarily for a couple of turns. So it is something you're going to have to be concerned about. Or if you're not interested in supporter race, you want to go with Dash for the income from trade tariffs and the income from all buildings. But again, you have that limitation in a campaign. The biggest limita limiting factor, though, in a case of campaign is their economy. Their economy is just pretty weak, all things considered. Now, the way Creative Assembly tried to balance this out is... If you get resource buildings like marble, you get various benefits like 4% construction costs for all building for all province capital settlement buildings, or an upkeep benefit with iron and so on and so forth. So there is a way to make Kislev's economy work, but you do need a significant amount of resources to even compete with other races to reach the potential that other races start with, let alone the potential that other races have throughout their entire campaign. So this is one this is the real rope that hangs around Kislev's neck. Now they can recruit units very cheaply using the farm estate. So that recruits, recruits, reduces recruitment costs by 30%. They can get atomans if they gain a lot of provinces. Those can also improve the income. The problem is uh, the problem is other races with much better economies have these kind of modifiers themselves one way or another and the base economic e economy that Kislev has is really weak and really expensive. So a base economic structure costs a thousand for a hundred gold. This takes 10 turns to justify the cost you're spending. Now, of course, with modifiers, this can be improved, but it is still a significant investment for very, very little in return. And this becomes a major issue. 
So while the scalability is there, especially once you get roads at tier four and caravans at uh, tier five, that gives you give you those tradable resources produced by fifty percent. While once you do get those, the you do you can get the powerful economy. The problem is you're always going to be behind compared to say green skins, compared to cafe, compared to Skaven, compared to many other races in the game. And you may be you may end up fighting those kind of races. Like compare Kislev to the Chaos Dwarves, like Astrogoth over here, or compare it to Grimgor or Azag or Draka. Those are the kind of problem. Like the problem with a limited economy, it means limited army. It means limited growth of your empire. The only thing that really keeps Key 7 in the game, so to speak, is the fact that their post battle loot, the amount of money they gain from a battle, can actually be significant enough to maintain their economy. But the settlements themselves, even with a vast, a vast amount of territory, your campaign is going to feel far more limited than it should. And I think like it creates a really bad dynamic in a campaign where gaining a lot of territory doesn't really amount to much and you have to spend resources. And the problem is, you can't just play defensively either. And this is also a big issue as Kislev. If you're playing Kislev campaign, you're not really the bulwark of the North holding back the forces of chaos. In fact, the best plan in your campaign is screw the North, screw Kislev, go conquer the Empire, or if you're playing Boris Ursus, go conquer the Darklands. Because that will give you a much safer position, a better defensive location, better resources, the ability to grow and maintain large armies. And then you go deal with Archeon and all of the issues that are present in the north. That is how uh, you can view things in a Kislev campaign. It is the best way of playing a campaign. And so I think like the way the campaign dynamic works for Kislev is not in line with how Kislev should play, because Kislev is the bulwark of the North. There should be the buffer state, if you will, for the Empire to hold back the forces of chaos. But in reality, if you're playing Kislev campaign, that's the last thing you want to do in that campaign. In fact, it's the worst decision. Part of it is the terrain. This particular area of the campaign map, including Kislev itself, is one of the most indefensible areas of the game. Like, look at look at the Goromandi Mountains. It's got a vast and exposed coastline where any faction that wants to attack you has so many opportunities to do so and take one of your settlements, really ruin the economy over there. It get, gets better with Prague, with the Southern Oblast, Western Oblast, etc., but the east in particular, and really the north, like if we're thinking about the giant home mountains, is an indefensible nightmare. So you, the last thing you want to do playing uh, as Kislev is to actually fight for Kislev. What you should do is, yes, you defeat Frat, you defeat um, Azazel, you defeat Trog potentially... And then you march south in the Empire, or you march against Astrogoth. Hell, Grimgor might even appreciate that and become one of your best friends in a campaign if you do so, if you wipe out the Chaos Orbs. I mean, if I'm playing a campaign as Boris Ursus, do you think I want to waste my time defending the North over here, or do I want to go try and make a beeline for uh, for uh, Tsar Nagrund and potentially take a Tier 4, tier four settlement for myself? I think I, I know what I'm aiming for and would potentially end up being better. I mean, you do want to take the special cities. I kind of screwed up over here. Catherine ended up taking Prague. Um, I do. You do want to take control over the special cities of Kislev, without a doubt. Uh, but outside of that, you don't really much care for Kislev. One particular campaign where I was playing um, as Boris Ursus, I think it was, I ended up taking all of the territory of Kislev. And here's what I did. I sold, uh, with the, pre the way the terrain was previously, I sold a continuous link of land between Ungrim, who ended up taking the northern world, world edge uh, mountains, I sold the southern oblast and troll country to Ungrim, and then he he, he to, held back the forces of Chaos. In fact, he was, had conquered half of Norska by the point uh, I had to do anything. Where, whereas I, in that campaign, was busily conquering like three quarters of the empire, Sylvania, Midland, Talabayam, dealing with Festus, and building up a massive, um, powerful force. That's not what Kisev should be, I think. And number six is Norska. And to understand the issues that Norska has, well, 
let's take a look at one of the important campaign mechanics that they do have. When you take over a settlement, you can either raise it to gain favor with a particular god, so the hound, the crow, the serpent, the eagle, or you can sack it and then, of course, occupy it. You do have a good amount of post battle loot, so that isn't really an issue. But the issue that exists for Norska is, on one hand, in order to win your campaign, if we look at the victory conditions, you do uh, long campaign victory conditions. You need to attain level three allegiance with one of the god, the gods, and uh, defeat all the challengers. Now, the problem with getting to that level three allegiance, you need to get a hundred, a uh, hundred allegiance. You need, you need to get a hundred of those points. The problem with that is you can only gain allegiance by raising settlements. The issue that gets created, as you might imagine, is raising settlements means they won't be available for you to take that turn. It also puts you, makes your army very vulnerable after just fighting a battle, because it puts you in a, it, it takes over, it, it removes all of your movement points. So you're in a vulnerable position, you're raising settlements that you might want to otherwise take for yourself, and quite crucially, you're missing out on all of the post battle loot that you otherwise would get. This creates an overall very bad campaign dynamic that Norska has to deal with, especially because Norska's land-based economy is really weak. I can complain about Kislev. It is cheaper, it's kind of hilarious, like even Norska can uh, recoup the costs they're spending on their income building in five turns as opposed to the ten turns as Kislev, but it is obviously a really bad situation with their economy on land. In fact, to the point that you don't even necessarily want to bother with the slaver camp uh, chain. The way you earn money is for looting, sacking settlements, and building ports. You do want to get allegiance high because that will increase the income from your ports. Managing the various allegiance between gods, getting the port income benefit can be a tricky affair to say the least. And the problem is it just doesn't work all that well. Another thing that's quite important for Norska and doesn't work quite that well are monster hunts. The problem with monster hunts is they're using the old quest system that we had in Warhammer 1 and 2. It hasn't really been updated. The problem that gets created is that it's bugged. Yes, it is a buggy system. You can easily fail an entire monster hunt and you can't even restart it or go for, uh, for it again or anything like that. It will just bug out. And these aren't insignificant events either. They are quite important. Furthermore, with regards to Norska's roster, one of the problems that Norska does have is that while their units can certainly be good, they're going to struggle and not resolve. They have low levels of armor. The leadership is okay, but the level of armor is certainly a problem. You can make it work with Norska Nice Trolls, with Marauder Champions, etc. It certainly can end up working, though you do have to spend two turns recruiting Marauder Champions. The power of the army roster certainly is there. Uh, what is, however, annoying when you're considering the situation that Norska uh, has to deal with is that the one hero that they can use for replenishment, the Bale Fiends, are, can only be recruited and increase capacity at tier 4. So one crucial hero that they have, that they want, is something they're going to need to get through, on, they can only get through tier 4 settlements. They can get sorcerers, they can get, uh, they can get skin wolves, all that, but it is certainly a limiting factor. Another limiting factor with the an, an, another limiting factor that does exist is the fact that outside of like the devotion for uh, to the gods lords that you get by increasing devotion you only have marauder chieftains to lead your armies which again limits your campaign in this kind of amount norska should be a fun race to play they certainly have the ability of winning battles that's not the question uh, they don't have any siege, their range is weak, but hey, monsters do work. A monster army can work very, very well if you use it. Like, you can get trolls uh, pretty quickly in a campaign. You can get skin wolves, Norsk and ice wolves if you want to. 
you certainly can get a good amount of power, but you're limited in economy, you're limited because of the legion system, you're limited in terms of heroes, you're limited in terms of lords, and you have a lot of bugs to deal with at the same time. Another problem that gets created for Norse guys, since their economy is based on ports, they, they actually end up having a very vulnerable economy because it's the AI is not necessarily so willing to traverse large distances over land to attack you. In fact, they might not attack you at all, but over the sea to just raid you and harass you and annoy you. Yeah, they're quite willing to do so. So like, look at Trog's situation over here. He's got Malice Darkblade that can genuinely wipe out <laughs> the main driver of his economy over here in the monolith of flesh, which can end up being a pretty substantial issue. Furthermore, because the Norskans hate each other, they have a minus 10 aversion with one another, you're likely going to end up in a war with the rest of Norska very, very quickly in a campaign. And while you can certainly confederate the rest of Norska, if you play your cards properly very quickly, that means you end up with a vast array of territory that's also quite vulnerable to a significant number of factions. And defending it, yeah, it becomes a nightmare. So the campaign dynamic there ends up not working quite as great as it should. Norska is difficult. Uh, like, the settlements that you want to defend, they're the ones that are difficult to defend. Sure, you do have territories, like, in the middle of Norska that are difficult for any attacker to reach, like, the Forbidden Cell, the Old Sarlin Camp, and, like, the entire mountains of Nagalfari, all that. Those can work quite well, but your ports, the main drivers of your economy, they're in vulnerable positions, and there's a lot of factions that do hate you. Like, Chaos doesn't get along well with Chaos. So yeah, bugs, limitations. Norska does need at least one DLC to really improve it as a faction, I think, to fill the gaps that they have, to fix the bugs that they are... Uh, played by to get some genuine economic improvement that might make that might put Norska in a good place. It is quite a shame because there can be a lot of fun playing with it from an army roster perspective, but the campaign mechanics are really outdated. And number five, there is the Empire. What is there more to say about the state of the Empire? It's one of the worst races in the game, and the reason is that the campaign mechanics, be it the uh, hostility meter that Marcus Wolfhart has to deal with, the Books of Nagash that Volkmar has to deal with, which by the way affects the Tomb Kings as well as Manfred. Though the Tomb Kings are in a better state as an overall race, I would argue. It, dealing with the Books of Nagash does not come anywhere close to dealing with the Imperial Authority system and all of the issues that get created in the campaign. Because basically a system forces you to care about the vast swath of territory from turn one when you might have only one province. And even when you do get more provinces, if you get more provinces, it's not really going to end up in a better situation. And it also severely limits you in diplomacy and confederations. It means you're going to waste dozens and dozens and dozens of turns just to confederate a faction that might only have two or three territories under its control. Yay, that's uh, great as a campaign uh, system. And even if you take that away from the Empire, they still have a unit roster that's very weak in the early campaign, only gets decent, and I emphasize the decent part, not great, only gets decent in the mid to late game. So, like, once you get to tier 3 and you get great swords, which, by the way, require a separate building in the armory to be able to recruit them, uh, once you get great swords, once you get huntsmen, once you get artillery at tier 4, in particular with great cannons and hellstorms, then the Empire is decent. But I emphasize the decent part. They're not one of the best races. Their lords and heroes are lacking in skill lines, with the exception of the Huntsman General. Well, I guess, like, the Arch Lecturers are okay as well, but not in a great state. That's the thing about the Empire. Even when everything is working in your way, even if you ignore all the major problems that get created by the campaign mechanics, by Books of Nagash, Imperial Authority, Hostility... Uh, even if you ignore the issues in the early game, like the most you're building up to is a race that ends up playing decently. I mean, with the exception of Volkmar, if he gets a lot of books, then there is certainly power of Volkmar because of the huge benefits he gets with all those books. But certainly that is quite an annoying system. By that point, most campaigns are over anyway, so it's like, ooh, you're building up strength. So you're dealing with a lot of pain and suffering to build that strength that 
you don't necessarily care about. And even then, even with all the strength you're building up, there's races that have that kind of level of strength from turn one or from the very early portion of their campaign. This is what the pro this is what marks the empire. They're behind a significant number of races. The DLCs they got, they got one in Warhammer 2, Marcus Wolfhart, who had his own unique campaign and the current system of Imperial Authority, and they got one in Warhammer 1 that introduced Volkmar. It wasn't a great situation for the Empire, even Warhammer 2, but right now with the way Warhammer 3 is playing compared to Warhammer 2 is in a far worse state of affairs, what the Empire has to deal with at the moment. Partly because AI changes, partly because of map changes, uh, just overall campaign dynamics no longer really favor the Empire. And out of the races that are going to be in front of the king, well, all of them need major reworks, but certainly the Empire does need a major rework to its campaign systems, a better situation in terms of recruitment, better situation with heroes and lords, and so on and so forth. And number four, we have the dwarves, the poor, miserable, forgotten, and short dwarves by Creative Assembly. Creative Assembly has never given the dwarves any kind of proper rework. There was only one paid DLC and one kind of soft rework with Forek, but that really was about it. Hopefully, Friends of the Cave will finally give the dwarves the proper mechanics that they could use, including things like, I know, the resource system that the cast dwarves are using because that's something that they could really really use in their campaigns what are the problems of dwarves well their army is strong but also fairly limited in terms of the play style you do have access to because if you're playing a dwarven campaign you really don't want to go beyond quarrelers and artillery Specifically grudge throwers into cannons, into organ guns, that's effectively what you want to use. Like, you would start with getting grudge throwers and quarrelers, and then eventually you'd get a combination of cannons and organ guns. Maybe a couple of iron drakes, but really, that's essentially it. So it is a limited playstyle. You only have two recruitment slots by default. You can increase it to three and four and even beyond that with structures, commandments, and even some very high-end research available over here would recite ancient grudges. But there are significant limitations that you do have when playing a Dwarven campaign. And even if you do use mods to resolve some of these issues, give them more variety, compared to the Chaos Dwarves, the Dwarves just feel rather boring to play. And they have limitations uh, in terms of their economy as well. It's not as bad as Kislev, to be sure. It's not a horrible economy. It will work, but it's not... A great economy either. J not being as bad as Kislev does not make one have a good economy. Now the difference between the Dwarves and Kislev is that the Dwarven economy can be better and the Dwarves do have some more options and scalability in their uh, campaign which can help make them work but even then they do fall behind compared to other races. You will have a limited number of armies that you'll play with in a Dwarven campaign. You don't have good casualty replenishment in a Dwarven campaign, so you're going to be forced to fight a lot of the battles manually. One of the reasons you would use Quarrelers and Grudge Throwers is because if you get even a couple of melee units, they'll take a substantial amount of damage through the auto resolve. It's not a great system of auto resolve, but the Dwarves certainly are feeling it. It's, well, the dwarves could make, uh, could handle it, if not for their poor casualty replenishment, uh, limitations as well, like the regular dwarf lords, if we look at them, like they don't have any kind of special skin line, there's nothing uh, special about them, lots of issues just overall with their design as a race, and the only campaign I could really recommend is Grum Brindle's campaign, and even then, only in the short term, because Grumbrindle actually kind of makes, uh, kind of handles those issues because he can gain a significant amount of casualty replenishment for just his own army. But faction wide, still going to be a lot of issues playing the dwarves. The research tree is bloated. The roster of units, while it's certainly good, the units that you do have access to, there's again no reason to go with anything other than quarrelers and grudge throwers. They also have flat out the worst growth of any race, and that means limited economy, further limiting the economy. Even if the structures are there, you just have to wait a significant long time because of the growth situation. 
and also further limiting the types of armies you would get in a campaign. Even if you did have, uh, e even if you wanted to go with something more than just quarrelers and grudge throwers, you really don't want to because you want in a dwarven campaign, like you might start by getting a bunch of uh, grudge throwers, uh, grudge throwers through the siege workshop, but then you'd abandon that and get a bunch of economic buildings and never stop there. It limits how many heroes you can get, it limits the number of armies uh, you can get, limits the size of your economy, limits the types of units you can recruit. It really boils down to, to growth being a significant issue in the campaign. The grudge system is also outdated as all hell. There are things you can abuse, like the forge in a dwarven campaign, but the systems they have and the balance they have in terms of their campaign situation is not good overall. And, you know, I'm looking at Total War Pharaoh and the customization that Creative Assembly is apparently implementing in the campaigns over there. Well, well you know, that seems like a great idea. Hopefully they would add something like that in Warhammer 3. We'll see. And number three is the Vampire Coast, a race that might as well not have an entire unit roster because the unit roster that they have, or the vast majority of it, is pretty awful to use. So consider all of the units that you have in the barrack chain, basically, until tier 4. They're all worthless. They have low armor, low leadership, they'll crumble very quickly in battle, and you will lose them after the battle. That's what you've got in store. It's not much better when you're thinking about uh, the rusty pistol trove chain, because with the exception of a couple of units, many of them are not uh, going to be that great. Like the Rotting Prometheans got a mob, that's a bit of a different affair, but when you're thinking about everything else, low armor, low leadership, they'll crumble very quickly, especially in siege battles, the towers, the, any kind of defender of well annihilate your units. You do have a couple of units, like uh, especially at the higher levels, that will uh, handle things, but the vast majority of ro your roster is low leadership, low armor, that just can't handle itself in a fight. And that can create a lot of issues. Your artillery is certainly really good, your basic mortars, your ca uh, carronades, though it's kind of interesting to think about the Vampire Coast artillery in the sense that they only have two really good units. I mean, you can consider deck gunners, but deck gunners have the same problem, that they'll be easily crumble into dust, whereas you can at least protect the regular mortars and carronades. They do work, they get the job done, they are effective in field battles, they're effective in sieges, that's quite an important factor. Now, an additional issue for the Vampire Coast is that when your army is lacking, the way you might may do, would be to rely on heroes. The problem they have with respect to heroes is that, well, regular vampire fleet captains can be, you can increase their capacity with the tier 5 port. Let's not even get into the issues of requiring a tier 5 port to increase hero capacity one by one, but at least you can do it. The problem is the other uh, heroes that you do have, the capacity for them cannot be increased for the horde armies that you have on select lords. Uh, they cannot be, you can increase at least the hero capacity of vampire fleet captain, so you can get a decent number of them, but you cannot increase uh, really the capacity of more goals until you get to tier 4 or tier 5 and get those particular structures. And keep in mind, these horde armies are going to be limited. Regular settlements don't increase hero capacity. Horde armies can increase hero capacity, but regular settlements cannot. Now, in a Vampire Coast campaign, you have your legendary lord, and you have four other armies that are hordes. That might sound decent enough until you get into the logistics of what it takes to build up those horde armies. Outside of that, what you need to use are pirate coves. Now, that means you go to a faction, beat them up, and build that kind of settlement. Of course, hero actions can also be used for something uh, like that. Um, if you want to set up a pirate cove, and but the problem is you're you're relying on that kind of settlement to increase your hero capacity, and that's really the main way to do so. It doesn't lead to a great ca a campaign dynamic where you have a faction that desperately needs those heroes to 
win sieges in particular, win battles, because their entire unit roster is awful garbage. Uh, but the way to increase that hero capacity is either to get the limited number of hordes that you do have access to. And keep in mind, it's not like you're just going to pump these hordes out instantly. You do require uh, to get 2,000 infamy to uh, get every single one of these admirals over here. So remember that aspect. But it creates a really bad di campaign dynamic that the Vampire Coast has to deal with. Not having a reliable army... Having heroes that are good, or at least the Mon Mongol hunters are good, and the vampire fleet captains are good, but requiring to get those kind of, of pirate coves in order to make that works uh, work. Like Mongol hunt hunters are certainly very effective heroes. Like they can punch way above their weight against many enemy units. In fact, this entire building chain is probably something you would want to get because they it actually contains some of the decent units that you want. People meme about Rotting Prometheans. I think I'd rather take Rotting Prometheans as opposed to everything over here with the exception of Depth Guard. And Depth Guard are expensive. Uh, rem uh, remember that... Uh, uh, remember that particular aspect. And they're still undead, and so, the, so they'll still crumble. You know, some, some races have units that have this level of armor at Tier 1 or Tier 2. You require Tier 4 to get them. That isn't a great campaign dynamic to have to deal with as the Vampire Coast. Far from it, quite the opposite. Uh, your economy is also limited. Yes, your economy, it's not quite as bad as Norska, but you're still, you know, you're still spending a thousand for a hundred. Though it can at least work with a, with a right to generate quite a bit of money from this, but it isn't a great uh, situation, your economy on land. Your ports can generate a decent amount of economy, but as I detailed with Norska, it's not a great situation. Norska is lower on this list because Norska at least has an army roster. You don't have an army roster. You have an artillery roster and some monstrous units, effectively, and some tier 4, tier 5 units, but that's, that's about it. Not a great campaign, pure misery to play every single one of their campaigns. Aranessa makes do because she can get Sartos of Free Company from very early on, uh, from Tier 1. And then she can get, get Ogres from Tier 3, uh, Maneaters specifically. So she at least has options, but the rest of them, they're screwed, One, regardless. One way or another. I mean, you can make it work, don't get me wrong. It's certainly, it's certainly something you can make work, especially with the power of the artillery, the sheer mass of artillery that you can bring to bear, and the sheer power of your heroes and lords, if you can get those heroes. That is. You can make it work. The first campaign I defeated, uh, I won in Immortal Empires, was as Noctilus. I am probably not going to be doing that again anytime soon. It, it ended up being a fairly miserable experience to deal with and number two is the demons all of them without exception well maybe the changeling if you want to consider that the great campaign i personally do not consider that the great campaign at all but the demons of chaos be it undivided with daniel honestly he, sh he should be here in this footage but Daniel, Kugaf, Kairos, and yes, Scarbrand and Nakari. Now, Scarbrand and Nakari, at least you can play their campaigns, and it doesn't necessarily feel like complete and utter misery the same way it feels with Kairos and Kugaf. But even then, their campaigns still have issues. I want to reiterate the point. Just because you can play a campaign, and you can play a campaign as any Legendary Lord, as win and win as any Legendary Lord on any difficulty, doesn't make it good. There's so many stupid comments is like oh you just don't know how to play to which i reply i do it's still awful <laughs> that's the point B being able to compete a uh, complete a campaign does not make something good i i wish to stress out now what's the problem with the demons um well reliance on dlc for another race to begin with or multiple races at this point uh Reliance on DLC for another race, if we're thinking about the Champions of Chaos. And by the way, Warriors of Chaos, for all the issues they have in terms of how boring their campaigns are, at least are far better designed than this uh, crap. And then to, you have to deal with the limitations of economy that Kuga has everything related to Daniel. The limitations of replenishment, authors of issues that Nakari has, the issues that 
uh, Kairos has, the issues that Scarbrand has. I mean, if you enjoy playing a campaign where you're just basically using tier 1 and tier 2 units for the entire campaign and never get access to the good stuff that Scarbrand has, and there are some really, really fun stuff, things to use in this roster, then you, you, never, you will never have access to. This is the kind of campaign where you don't care at all about territory and just go with one army and summon blood hosts to the infinite to win the campaign isn't a great campaign dynamic it forces you to for, uh, to play unlimited numbers of manual battles to win you can win a campaign in much fewer turns than any other race in the game or most other races in the game but if you enjoy playing a thousand different manual battles especially against weak garrisons just so you don't take any kind of casualties and winning them with just scarbrand on his own well i guess that's for you but I imagine that's not the kind of campaign situation that many other people would enjoy. Or Nakari's situation. Nakari's situation where, yeah, it's fun, I admit. It is genuinely a lot of fun to conquer all of Wolf 1 and vassalize all of Wolf 1. And then you realize, oh, I just have won the campaign, but now I have to go click that intern button, fight battles, take the territory on my own, fight manual battles, even though there's nothing that can defeat me. It doesn't create the great campaign dynamic to deal with. Fairly limited, at least Nakari has scalability in his campaign, her campaign, their campaign, whatever you want to call it, uh, over there. So yeah, Scarbrand, just, Scarbrand, Kugaf, Kairos, Nakari, the Demon Prince, they all have major issues in the way their campaigns were designed. Like, I think we really see the limitations with Creative Assembly's design from Realms of Chaos into something like Immortal Empires. And it's not like the demons were that great in Realms of Chaos either. You tell me Kugaf and Kairos were great in Immortal Empires? No, they were not. Scarbrand could do some ridiculous things. He can still do some very ridiculous things, don't get me wrong on that. But just overall, it doesn't really work, I, I think, that great. Just because you, oh, you can get a lot of power. Well, you're not going to have money. Your economy is going to be constantly in the red. You might say, well, that's a unique campaign design. I'm like, the problem with doing it, the way they decided to do it on, like, Scarbrand's campaign, and he and Nakari have two, the two better campaigns out of the bunch, uh, the problem with the way they decide to do it, it just doesn't quite fit within the context of Immortal Empires. Now, this is where we get another set of stupid comments like oh you just want every race to be the same no i greatly appreciate uniqueness but the races need to work within the context of the campaigns that we have like you look at the cast dwarves they work very well within the context of of the immortal empire's map or the dark elves work or the skaven work do those races play the same no i don't fucking think so so i hate those kind of asinine comments it's like you 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 want every race to play the same. No, I want every race to be good and unique and interesting to play, not feeling like pulling uh, pulling teeth playing these, because that's how Scarbrand's campaign can feel like. You, like, look at this campaign situation. You're wasting turns just to go raise these settlements. You're not even capturing this territory. Your settlement over here is going to eventually be annihilated by Mr. Forrick, and you're not even going to defend it. You just march over all the way over here on the coastline. This is Scarbrand's campaign dynamic. There are various ways to play it. One of the ways plenty of people play it is, like, you either go for Forrick to wipe him out and go to the east, or you go to the west, wiping out the top knots over here, wiping out Warzag, ending up over here in Barrack Var, and by that point, the cult will appear over here in this um, in this area of the campaign map. You teleport to the cult, you slaughter everything in your path with blood hosts and your army, and your army of tier uh, tier one, tier two units. Like you get blood letters, or you get. Or you more realistically just get yourself a bunch of cast warriors of corn uh, in the campaign. You get the entire army of those guys. You slaughter your way over uh, from the not the deadwood from um, from this location from the sharp bastion. You slaughter your way to Ulfan. You butcher Nakari. You butcher the uh, the high elves, and you win the campaign. That's the Scarbrand experience. There are various ways of doing it, but ultimately you don't want to achieve that long campaign victory condition. I want to see someone defeat an endgame crisis with Scarbrand. I really want to see how fun that experience would be for them. Because being able to do that crap in like 20 turns or something like that, 
that is not an exceptional feat, right? Especially when you just get reset movement range and you can abuse Scarbrand to win every battle. But it doesn't make it a good campaign. Fun fact, power does not make for a good campaign. Warriors of Chaos have power. They don't have great campaigns, I think. And same with the Wind Elves. They, they can be very boring. Or the Changeling, the most powerful Legendary Lord in the game by far, he doesn't have a great campaign either. So, regardless though, all the demonic races, Kugaf Kairos, uh, Kugaf Kairos, Daniel, Scarbrand, Nakari, they needed significant overhauls. Kairos should have gotten his already. He didn't. Nothing changed. Zero. Zilch. Nothing. If this is the way they're going to treat the demons going forward, that, honestly, like, I think creative... I think there's two things at play here. One of these things is the fact that uh, Creative Assembly doesn't want to put an effort after they already put an effort to design these races originally in Realms of Chaos. They don't want to put in the effort to redesign them or improve them and improve the campaign dynamics. And two, I think that the people currently working on Warhammer 3, the DLC team, doesn't care that much about these races, really. They, they have their races that they care about. Like, they really put... I think it really shows that the same people that worked on Forge of the Chaos Dwarves, probably they spent more time on it, I'll grant you that. But the same people worked on Forge of the Chaos Dwarves, did such a brilliant job with that, and then they put in zero effort to fix Kislev, uh, to, fi to fix Kislev, or to fix, um, or to fix Kairos. They did improve Cafe for all that's worth, however. And finally, the Ogre Kingdoms. Fun idea, by the way. The day one DLC races, the pre-order bonus races that Creative Assembly has made for Warhammer 3. Well, all three of them have been awful to a degree or another. Like Warriors of Chaos were really bad until the Champions of Chaos DLC. Norska is still bad and now you have the Ogres. And Ogres are universally despised by the community. It's also pretty telling that out of 20 races in the game, and I am considering all the demons as part of the same race, uh, out of 20 races in the game, 7 of them do need significant overhaul. So that's close to a third, or over a third, of all races in the game do need overhauls to work. Some of them should have received those overhauls already, but they didn't. Now, what's the problem with the Ogres? Well, if you enjoy playing a race where the unit roster you're going to use for the vast majority of the early game comes down to Ogre Bulls, Noblars, and variants of Ogre Bulls, go right ahead. Because that's what you're going to get with the Ogres. Personally, I just get a bunch of Ogre Bulls and then Ogre Bulls with dual weapons and Iron Fists and eventually get Gorgers and Iron Guts. There are mods that do improve it. So the unit roster is incredibly limited from a practical standpoint. The ogres do have a lot of really good and fun units over here that they can use. Then they also have a bunch of the re same repeatable crap that does drag them down. The lack of armor piercing with ogre bulls also is a pretty, pro a pretty pro problematic early on in the campaign. Then their economy is also a very limited one. 50 for 250. That is great. The way they should work is you make camps, but camps are vulnerable. They do generate meat, but you can't move them by default. There are mods that fix that. But when you're thinking about the camps, you can only get four camps in 55 turns. That's how long it's going to take you to research that. I mean, okay, you can get... Uh, you you can get um, you can get four camps you you can get four camps um, early or free camps you can you can get four camps a bit earlier than that but really if you want to get uh, a lot of camps like you need to wait seventy three turns that's when you can build up as the ogres and even then the individual camps are not necessarily going to give you that much of an economy boost. It's only when you get a lot of camps and a lot of territory together that the ogres can stand on their own. So their campaigns end up, again, being fairly limited. You can't compete with other factions that have more armies than you, and individually those armies are stronger than what you have. <laughs> That's the sad state of affairs with regards to ogres. They just end up being fairly limited. 
And hero capacity, same thing. Like, you need camps for hero capacity. Uh, regular lords, like ogre lords, like the tyrants are pretty much never worth using uh, uh, in a campaign because, well, they're just not. They're not great in a significant number of ways uh, to bother with those tyrants. The camps being indefensible and ne you never want to put an army in them. There are mods that do fix this, these, but ogres just feel like really awful to play and I think you can understand how much a race can achieve and how good a race is based on how how well the AI does in control of them like the ogre AI rarely amounts to much in any kind of long campaign early are they do start promising but then the issues that they have with their economy scalability how little settlements give to the ogres how little how little worth there is in, t in acquiring territory for the ogres it all ends up hurting them in a pretty substantial way in their campaign. And I think, like, I really hope that Creative Assembly is going to finally move past this idea of making a day one DLC race that they then ignore for years and years. Because Warriors of Chaos, it took years for them to improve them in any meaningful way. And they did, to be clear, they did. But then you look at Norska, and now you look at Ogres. Hell, you can even look at the Yellow Turbans for Free Kingdoms. Like the Yellow Turban pre-order bonus, not the DLC that came later. The Yellow Turban's not in a great state either as uh, as DLC over there. Though they then gave them a DLC that uh, did affect them <laughs> later on. For a specific period that where they did uh, improve the yellow turbans but still lots of issues across the board with ogres in terms of inner recruitment hero capacity their lord situation their camp situation their economy situation they should be really powerful as a race they should be the ultimate weapon against chaos and yeah they ha hold they can't really do a good job in their campaigns like i think ogres have been one of the worst races to play since the game came out like all the demons plus the ogres i mean none of the races like cafe is the only one that's really good out of the original warhammer free races that's kind of saying something about warhammer free i think that it's also worth pointing out that you look at the races that are in this video you see all the demon races and yes i would include them you see kislev you see the ogres the only race that's not in here that launched with Warhammer Free is Cafe. That's it. And Cafe still has its issues, but it's in a substantially better place than it was before. Anyway, Quasini here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.